Mistress Mary! Oh! 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 It's you. You ain't go away, if you like. Because I don't want you, you know. Haven't you anything to say to me? Oh, yes. Are uh, the birds all caged? The wild beasts all sit down? Are the locks, chains, bolts, and bars in good order? Is the little ease sufficiently uncomfortable? The rats? Pieces and thumb screws already forward? Oh, you brute! <laughs> These allusions to my professional duties are in doubtful taste. I didn't become a head jailer because I like head jailing. I didn't become an assistant tormentor because I liked assistant tormenting. We can't all be sorcerers, you know. <laughs> you brought that upon yourself. Colonel Fairfax is not a sorcerer. He's a man of science and an alchemist. Well, whatever he is, he won't be one long, for he's to be beheaded <gasps> today for dealing with the devil. His master nearly had him last night when the fire broke out in the Beecham Tower. How I wish he'd escaped in the con all the confusion. But take care, there's still time for a reply for his petition for mercy. Ah, I'm content to charge that. This evening, at half past seven. What? <laughs> You're a cruel monster to speak so unfeelingly to the death of a young and handsome soldier. Young and handsome? How do you know he's young <laughs> and handsome? Because I've seen him every day for weeks past, taking his exercise in the Beecham Tower. Curse him. There. I believe you're jealous of him. Jealous of a man I've never spoken to. Jealous of a poor soul who's to die in an hour. I am. I'm jealous of everybody and everything. I'm jealous of the very words I speak to you. Because they reach your ears. And I mustn't go near them. How unjust. Jealous of the words you speak to me? Why, you know as well as I do that I don't even like them. You used to like them? I used to pretend that I liked them. It was mere politeness to comparative strangers. I don't believe you know what jealousy is. I don't believe you know how it eats into a man's heart and disorders his digestion and turns his interior to boiling lead. Oh, you're a heartless jade to trifle with the delicate organization of the human interior. <laughs>
day, Dame Carruthers. Kate, busy today? Busy, aye. The fire in the beacon last night has given me work enough. A dozen poor prisoners. Uh, Richard Colfax, Sir Martin Bysleet, Colonel Fairfax, war in the preacher poet. <laughs> <laughs> and half a score others, all packed into one small cell, not six feet square. Poor Colonel Fairfax, who is to die today, is to be removed to number 14 in the cold harbor, that he may have his last hour alone with his confessor, and I have to see to that. Poor gentleman. He'll die bravely. I fought under him not two years since, and he valued his life as if it were a feather. He's the bravest, the handsomest, and the best young gentleman in England. He twice saved my father's life. And it's a cruel thing, a wicked thing, and a barbarous thing that one so gallantly hero should lose his head. Oh, it's the handsomest head in England. For dealings with the devil, aye. <laughs> All were beheaded who dealt with him. They'd be busy doings on Tower Green. <laughs> you know very well that Colonel Fairfax is a student of alchemy, nothing more and nothing less. But this wicked tower. Like a cruel giant in a fairy tale, must be fed with blood, and that blood must be the best and the bravest, or it's not good enough for the old blunderbore. <laughs> Silence, you silly girl. You know not what you say. I was born in the old keep, and I've grown gray in it. And please God, I shall die and be buried in it. And there's not a stone in its walls that is not as dear to me as my own right hand. <laughs> <laughs>
No, my lass. But there is one hope yet. Thy brother Leonard has been appointed the yeoman of the guard as a reward for his valor in saving his standard and cutting his way through 50 foes who would have hanged him. He shall arrive today, and as he comes straight from Windsor where the court is, it may be, it may be, that he will bring the expected reprieve with him. Oh, that he may. Oh, amen to that. For he has twice saved my life. I would give the rest of my life to save his. Then wilt thou not be glad to welcome thy brave brother, with the fame of whose exploits all England is arraying? I truly, if he brings the reprieve. That's not otherwise. Well, he is a brave fellow indeed, and I love brave men. All brave men? Well, most of them, most of them, I verily believe. But I hope that it will not be too strict to me. They say he's a very dragon of virtue in certain sections. Now, my dear old father, his kindness itself and his. Man, leaves thee pretty well to thine own ways, eh? <laughs> well, I have no fears to thee. Thou hast a feather brain, but thou art good lass. Yes, that's all very well. But this lender is going to tell me that I may not do this, and I may not do that. And I must not talk with this one, or walk with that one. But how do the world is lying with lips pursed, and my eyes cast down, like a poor nun, who has renounced mankind? Why, as I have not renounced mankind, and do not need to renounce mankind, I won't have it. There! <laughs> Nay, baby, he'll not check thee more than is necessary. Ah, he is a brave fellow. The bravest among brave fellows, and yet it seems like only yesterday he was robbing the lieutenant's orchard. <laughs> oh. Leonard, my brave boy! Oh, I am right glad to see thee. Oh, and so is thy sister Phoebe. Aye, has thou brought Colonel Fairfax reprieve? Nay, I have here a dispatch for the lieutenant, but no reprieve for the colonel. Poor gentleman, poor gentleman. Aye, would that I had brought better news. I'd give my right hand, nay, my body, my life, to save his. Dost thou mean those words? I, um, father, I'm no braggart. Did he not save thy life, and am I not his foster brother? Then hearken to me. Thou hast come to join the yeoman of the guard. Well? And none has seen thee but ourselves. And a sentry who took but scant notice of me. Now to prove thy words, give me the dispatch. Get thee hence at once. Here is money, and I'll send thee more. Now lie hidden for a space, and let no one know. I'll convey a suit of yeoman's uniform to the colonel's cell. He shall shave off his beard, so no one shall know him. And I'll own him as my own son, the brave Leonard Merrill, who saved his flag and cut his way through fifty foes who thirsted for his life. <laughs> Uh, he will be welcomed without question by my fellow yeoman. I'll warrant that. But how to get access to the colonel's cell? The key is with thy sour-faced admirer, Wilfred Shadbolt. I think, I say I think, I can get anything I want from Wilfred. I think, mind, I say I think. You can leave that to me. <laughs> <laughs> Then get thee hence at once, lad, and bless thee for this sacrifice. And take my blessing too, dear, dear Leonard. <laughs> and thine, eh? <laughs> Thy love is newborn. Wrap it up carefully, lest it take cold and die. <laughs> <laughs> And well may fail, but ours are not the hearts that quail, the hands that shrink, the cheeks that pale in hours of need. No, ours are not the hearts that quail, the hands that shrink, the cheeks that pale, the hands that shrink, the cheeks that pale. Not. That life is his, so count it not. 
And shall I wreck and risk thy wrath? And so the souls are to be done to save the life of such an one. Be of good cheer, lass. We may save him yet. Oh, see, Father, they bring the poor condemned gentleman to the beaten tower. Oh, Father, his hour is not yet Oh, come. no, no, no. Did they lead him to the cold harbor tower to await his end in solitude? Oh, soft. The lieutenant approaches. He must not see thee weep. Sir, I greet thee with all good will, and I thank thee for the zealous care with which thou hast guarded me from the pestilent dangers which threaten human life outside. In this happy little community, death, when he comes, does so in punctual and business-like fashion, and like a courtly gentleman, giveth due notice of his advent that one may not be taken unawares. Sir, you bear it bravely, as a brave man should. Why, sir? Tis no light boon to die swiftly and surely at a given hour and in a given fashion. Truth to tell, I would gladly have my life. But if that may not be so, I have the next best thing, which is death. Believe me, sir, my lot is not so much amiss. Oh, father, father, I cannot bear it. Oh, my poor lass. <laughs> Nay, pretty one, come be comforted. A life such as mine is not worth weeping for. Sergeant Merrill, is it not? May I drink, my old friend? My man, what's all this about? Thou and I have faced the grim old king a dozen times, and never has his majesty come in such goodly fashion. Keep a stout heart, good fellow. We are soldiers, and we know how to die, thou and I. Uh, take my word for it. Tis easier to die well than to live well. <laughs> or in sooth, I have tried both. <laughs> Is life a bone? If so, it must be fall. The death, whenever he call, must call too soon. The four score years he give, yet one would pray to live another moon. What kind of plaint have I, who perish in July, who perish in July? I might have had to die perchance in June. I might have had to die perchance in June. Here's life upon the count is not a wit. Nay, count is not a wit. Might as well die. I might have had to live another more. I might have had to live to live another more.
I have a bone to bear. I am in this strait for no better reason than because my kinsman, Sir Clarence Hawkwistle, one of the secretaries of state, has charged me with sorcery in order that he might succeed in my estate, which devolves to him, provided I die unmarried. Which thou wilt most surely do. Nay, as I will most surely not do, by your worship's grace. I have a mind to thwart this good cousin of mine. How? Oh. By marrying forthwith, to be sure. What? Heaven and mercy. For whom wouldst thou marry? Nay, I am indifferent on that score. Coming death hath made of me a true and chivalrous knight, who holds all womankind in such esteem that the oldest and meanest and worst favoured of them is good enough for him. And so, my good lieutenant, if thou wouldst help a poor soldier who has but an hour to live, find me the first that comes. My confessor shall marry us, and her dower shall be my dishonored name, and a hundred crowns to boot. No such poor dower for an hour of matrimony. A strange request. I doubt I should be warranted in granting it. There never was a marriage prop with so little of evil to the contracting par parties. In an hour, she'll be a widow, and I, a bachelor again for our time now. I will see what can be done, for I hold this kinsman of thine in abhorrence for the scurvy trick he has played thee. A thousand thanks, good fellow. We meet again on this spot in an hour or so. I, I will be a, I will be a bridegroom then, and your worship will wish me joy. Until then, farewell. I'm ready, good fellows. He is a brave fellow. It is a pity he should die. But how to find him a bride at such short notice? Well, the task should be easy.
there in his song and dance too. Travels with us, for Elsie is a good girl. 
But the old woman is abed with fever, and we have come here to pick up some silver to buy a luxury for her. Pardon me, my girl. Your mother is ill? Thoroughly ill, sir. And needs good food and many things which thou canst not buy? Alas, sir, it is too true. Put thou an um, hundred crowns? An hundred crowns? They might save her life. Then listen. A worthy but unhappy gentleman is to be beheaded in an hour on this very spot. <laughs> For sufficient reason, he desires to marry before he dies and has asked me to find him a wife. Should thou be that wife? The wife of a man I have never seen? Why, sir, look you, I am concerned in this. For though I am not yet wedded to wealthy Maynard, time works wonders, and there's no knowing what may be in store for us. Have we, O oh, worship's word for it, that this gentleman will die today? Nothing is more certain, I grieve to say. And that the maiden will be allowed to depart the very instant the ceremony is at an end? The very instant. I have my honor that it shall be so. An hundred crowns? An hundred crowns. For my part, I consent. It is for Elsie to speak. I'll say your maid and will your wed a man about to lose his head. For half an hour you'll be a wife and then the doubt is yours for life. I then let the bridegroom why refuse in truth of her most bridegrooms are then married to lose the head and the heart as well. for such a post. Many, sir. I have a pretty wit. I can rhyme you extempore. I can convulse you with quip and conundrum. 
I have the lighter philosophy that my tongue sip. I can be merry, wise, quaint, grim, and sardonic. One by one, or all at once. <laughs> I have a pretty turn for anecdote. I know all the just ancient and modern, past, present, and to come. I can riddle you from dawn of day to set of sun. And if that content you not, well unto midnight and the small hours. Oh, sir, a pretty wit, I warrant you. A pretty, pretty wit. <laughs> I drive and joke, and quip and crank, for lowly folk, and men of rank. I fly my craft, and know no fear, but in my shop, at print of fear, at care of rinse, at rinse of fear. I aim my shot and know no fear. I have women from the east and from the west that subject to no academic rule. You may find it in the jeering of a jest or the still from the folly of a fool. I can teach you with a quip if I don't mind. I can trick you with a learning with a laugh. Oh, riddle on a folly, 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 and you'll find a greater to approve among the class. Oh, riddle on a folly, 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 and you'll find a greater to approve among the class. I can set a bracket quailing with a quip. The other I can wither with a whim. He may wear a merry laugh upon his lip, but his laughter has an echo that is grim. When they're offered to the world in many guise, unpleasant when they're followed with a whim. For he would make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise, should always gild the philosophic pill. For he would make his fellow, fellow, fellow creatures wise, should always gild the philosophic pill. And how came you to leave your last employ? Why, sir, it was in this wise. My lord was the Archbishop of Canterbury. And it was considered that one of my jokes was unsuited to his grace's family circle. In truth, I ventured to ask a poor riddle, sir. Wherein lay the difference between his grace and poor Jack Point? His grace it was pleased to give it up, sir. And thereupon I told him that, whereas his grace was paid 10,000 a year for being good, poor Jack Point was good for nothing. <laughs> it was but a harmless jest. But it offended his grace, who whipped me and set me in the stocks for a scurl road, and so we parted. I had at least not take post again with the dignified clergy. Uh, but I trust you are very careful not to give offense. I uh, have daughters, sir. My jokes are most carefully selected, and anything objectionable is expunged. If your honor pleases, I will try them first on your honor's chaplain. Uh, can you give me an example? Uh, suppose I had sat me down hurriedly on something sharp. Sir, I should say that you had sat down on the spur of the moment. Uh, don't think much of that. That's the best you can do. It has always been much admired, sir, but uh, we will try again. Well, then, I am at dinner, and that the joint of meat is but half cooked. Why then, sir, I should say that what is underdone cannot be helped. I see. I think that sort of thing would be somewhat irritating. Oh, at first, sir, perhaps, but youth is everything, and you would come in time to like it. Uh, well, uh, uh, suppose I had caught you kissing the kitchen wench under my very nose. Under her very nose, good sir, not under yours. <laughs> <laughs> that was where I would kiss her. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir, pretty, uh, bit, pretty, pretty bit. But the lady comes. Uh, follow me, friend, and we shall discuss this matter at length in my library. I am your worship's servant. Uh, that is to say, I trust I soon shall be. But before proceeding to a more serious topic, 
Can you tell me, sir, why a cook's brain pan is like an overwound clock? Oh, the truth to this fooling. Follow me. Just my luck. My best conundrum. Wasted! <laughs> It is an odd freak that a young man and his confessor should be closeted alone with a strange singing girl. Uh, I would fain have espied them, but they stopped up the keyhole. My keyhole! Rupert, I'm alone. Now, what could he have wanted with her? That's what puzzles me. Now, to get the key. <laughs> no. 
son. <laughs> Thine adored Fairfax is to die. Nay, thou knowest I have not but pity for the poor condemned gentleman. I know that he who is about to die is more to thee than I, who am alive and well. Why, that were out of reason, dear Wilfred. Do they not say that a live ass is better than a dead lion? <laughs> no, they don't mean that. Oh, they say that, do they? It's unpardonably rude of them. But I believe they put it that way. Not as it applies to me, who art thou clever beyond all telling. Oh, yes, as an assistant tormentor. Nay, as a wit, as a humorist, as a most philosophic commentator on the vanity of human resolution. Truly, I have seen great resolution give way under my persuasive methods <laughs> in the nice regulation of a thumbscrew. In the hundredth part of a single revolution lieth all the difference between stony silence and a torrent of impulsive unbosoming that the pen can scarcely follow. <laughs> Oh, I am a mad wag. Thou art a most light hearted and delightful companion, Master Wilfred. Thy anecdotes are the torture chamber, are the prettiest hearing. Uh, I, I am a pleasant fellow, and I choose. I believe I am the merriest dog that barks. Ah. <laughs> uh, we might be passing happy oh, together. Yes, I told you. <laughs> For thou wouldst make a most tender <laughs> and loving wife. I, oh, one whom I really loved, all there is a wealth of love within this little heart, saving up for, I wonder whom. Now, of all the world of men, I wonder whom to think. He who I am twin is now alive and somewhere, perhaps far away, perhaps close at hand, and I know him not. It seems I am wasting time in not knowing him. Now say that it is I. Nay, suppose it for the nonce. Say that we are wed. Suppose it only. Say that thou art my very bride, and I. Thy cheery, joyous, bright, bright oh! husband, and that the day's work being done, princely stored away for the night, and I, and I, alone, together, with a long, long evening before us. Oh, it's a pretty picture, but I, I seriously know what come so unexpectedly, and yet. And yet, were I thy bride. I, weren't I thou, thy, wert thou my bride? Oh, how I would love thee. <laughs>
Not yet. But Lord, how she woos! I should be no mean judge of wooing, seeing that I have been more hotly wooed than most men. Uh, I have been wooed by maid, widow, and wife. I have been wooed boldly, timidly, fearfully, shyly, by direct assault, by suggestion, by implication, by inference, and by <laughs> innuendo. But this wooing is not of the common order. It is the wooing of one who needs must woo me <laughs> if she die for it. <laughs> He is so far safely accomplished. <laughs> the sly hoops. How she wheedled him. <laughs> what a helpless ninny is a lovesick man. <laughs> he is but, but a lute in a woman's hand. She plays upon him whatever tone she will. <laughs> oh, but the colonel comes. In faith, he's just in time for the omen parade here for his execution in two minutes. <laughs> My good and kind friend, thou runnest a grave risk for me. Ah, uh, tut, sir, no risk. I'll warrant none here to recognize you. You'll make a brave yeoman, sir. Oh, but this rough is too high. So, ha <laughs> Here's your homework, sir. Carry it thus. Oh, the yeoman come. Remember, you are my brave son, Leonard Merrill. If I may not bear my own name, none other I would bear so readily. Then put a bold face on it, sir, for they come.
I beg your pardon. Don't you know me? I'm little Phoebe. Phoebe? Is this Phoebe? What? Little Phoebe? Why did you say Phoebe? It can't be Phoebe, surely. Yes, it's Phoebe. Your sister Phoebe. Your own little sister. Afternoon tonight, 
A certain poor wit, being an hunger, did meet a well-fed counselor. Merry fool, quoth the counselor, whither away? In truth, said the poor wag, in that I have eaten not these two days, I do wither away, and that right rapidly. The counselor laughed hugely and gave him a sausage. <laughs> the counselor was easier to please than my new master, the lieutenant. I would like to take post under that counselor. Oh, tis but melancholy mummy when poor, heartbroken, jilted Jack Point must needs turn to you, Ambrose, for original light humor. Ah, uh, Master Point. Ha! Friend Jailer. Jailer that was. Jailer that never shall be more. Jailer that jailed not, or that jailed, if jail he did, so unjailerly that was but Jerry jailing, or jailing in joke. Though no joke to him, who by unjailer like jailing did so jeopardize his jailership. <laughs> Come, take heart, smile, <laughs> laugh, <laughs> <laughs> wink, twinkle, thou tormentor that tormentest none, thou rackest racket, not, thou painter out of place. Come, take heart and be merry as I am, as I am. Ah, it is well for thee to laugh. Thou hast a good post, and hast cause to be merry. Cause? Have we not all cause? Is not the world a big butt of humor into which all who will may drive a gimlet? See, I am a salaried wit. And is there aught in nature anything more ridiculous? A man who is dull and heartbroken and must needs be merry or he will be whipped. Who must rejoice lest he starve? Who must jest you, jive you, quip you, crank you, rap you, riddle you from hour to hour, from day to day, from year to year, lest he dwindle, perish, starve, pine, and die? Why, when there's naught else to laugh at, I laugh at myself till I ache for it. <laughs> Yet I have often thought that a jester's calling would suit me to a hair. Thee? Would suit thee, thou death's head and crossbones? Aye. I have a pretty wit, a light, airy, joysome wit, spiced with anecdotes of prison cells and the torture chamber. Oh, a very delicate wit! I have tried it out on many a prisoner, and there have been some who smiled, 
No, no, it is not easy to make a prisoner smile, and it should not be difficult to be a good jester, seeing that thou art one. Difficult? Nothing easier, nothing easier. Attend, and I will prove it to thee. Old Craig the Fool is a light hearted lunatic in this is a popular rumor. From the morn to the night, he's a joyous and bright, and he bubbles with wit and good humor. He's acquainted to turn both in prose and in verse, yet the people forgive his transgression. There are one or two rules that all family fools must observe if they love their profession. There are one or two rules, half a dozen maybe, that all family fools of whatever degree must observe if they love their profession. If you wish to succeed as a jester, you'll need to consider each person's auricular. What is all right for me, we're quite scandalized, see, for C is so very particular. And D may be dull, and he very thick skull is as empty of brains as a ladle, while F is F sharp. And we'll cry with a car that he's known your best joke from his cradle. When your humor they love, you can't let yourself go. And it does what you love when the person says, Oh, I know that old joke me fail. When your master is silly from getting up early and tempered and show up in the morning, and an opportune joke is enough to provoke him to give you at once a month's warning, then if you refrain, he is at you again, for he likes to get valuable money. He'll ask them there. With an insolent stare, if you know that you're paid to be funny, it answers the task of a man in his place, and your principal laughs with a skull in his face. If you know that you're paid to be funny, comes a bitch of baby for a solemn need, he won't be aware of his anger provoking. Better not pull his hair, just stick pins in his hair, he don't understand practical joking. If the jest that you crack have an orthodox knack, you may get a last mark on these agents, but should they by chance? Be imported from France. Half a crown to stop dog and joke wages. It's a general rule for your zeal and make wages. The family fool comes and joke with two friends. Half a crown to stop dog and his wages. Though your head it may rack with a bilious attack in your senses with toothache you're losing. Don't be mopey and flat, they don't find you for that if you're properly quaint and amusing. Though your wife ran away with a soldier that day and took with her your trifle of money, bless your heart. They don't mind. They're exceedingly kind. They don't blame you as long as you're funny. It's a comfort to feel that your partner should let. Though you suffer a deal, they don't mind it a bit. They don't blame you so long as you're funny. My sweetheart, Elsie Maynard, was secretly wed to this Fairfax half an hour ere he escaped. She did well. She did nothing of the kind, so hold thy peace and perpend. Now, while he liveth, she is dead to me and I to her. So my jibes and jokes notwithstanding, I am the saddest and the sorriest dog in England. Thou art a very dull dog indeed. Now. If thou wilt swear that thou didst shoot this Fairfax while he was trying to swim across the river, it needs but the discharge of an arquebus on a dark night, and that he sank and was seen no more, I'll make thee the very Archbishop of Jesters, and that in two days' time. Now, what sayest thou? I am... <clears throat> I am to lie? Heartily. But thy lie must be a lie of circumstance, which I will support with the testimony of eyes, ears, and tongue. And thou wilt qualify me as a... Jester? As a jester among jesters. I will teach thee all my original songs, my self-constructed riddles, my own ingenious paradoxes. Nay, more. I will reveal to thee the source whence I get them. Now what sayest thou? <laughs> Why, if it be but a lie thou wantest of me, I hold it cheap enough and I say yes. It is a bargain. <laughs> Here upon the golden tree, all that we do, we do, we secure my solemn deed, to prevent 
Dolder men do, and now see I'm cold with a story grim and gory. Of the spare facts I know, I declare to your swear to. I can swear to. I declare to. I can swear to. I declare to. I declare to your swear to. I declare to. Tell a tale of cock and bull. All amazed in detail full. Tales and tales and defend us. What a tale of cock and bull. In return for my heart, my making undertaking to start doing the art of amazing wonder raising of a gesture just decree. Composition, high ambition, and a lively one of these. Waggle waggy, never flagging. 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 Waggle waggy. There's a tale of cock and bull, all convincing detail. Tales and men just hand in hand. What a tale of cock and bull. What tale of cock? What tale of bull? What a tale of cock and bull, cock and bull, cock and bull, heavy men, what a tale of And a lively one of these, waggle wagging, never flagging, waggle wagging, never flagging, waggle wagging, never flagging, waggle wagging, never flagging, waggle wagging. Tell a tale of fuck and bull, all convincing detail. Tales are men just hand defend us. What a tale of fuck and bull, what tale of fuck, what a tale of bull, what tale of fuck. And no news of poor Fairfax. The dogs, they seek him everywhere, save within a dozen yards of his dungeon. So, I am free. Free but for the cursed haste with which I hurried headlong into the bonds of matrimony with... Heaven knows whom. <laughs> as far as I remember, she should have been young. But even had not her face been concealed by her kerchief, I doubt whether in my then flight I should have taken much note of her. Free. Bah! The tower bonds are but a thread of silk compared to these conjugal fetters, which I, fool that I was, placed upon mine own hands. From the one I broke readily enough, but how to break the other? <laughs> Till his last heart 
Shives that no snake can weld, no rusty part. But the monarch's hand had set him free. Above the captive band, the sun. The saddest saddest And how fares thy pretty charge, Elsie Maynard? Oh, well enough, sir. She's quite strong again and leaves us tonight. Well, thanks for being for other kind nursing, eh? I do take the old witch. <laughs> Twas a sorry trick you played me, sir, to bring that fainting girl to me. You gave the old lady an excuse to take up her quarters in my house. And here for the last two years, I've been shunning her like the plague. <laughs> Another day of it, she would have married me. Oh, good Lord, here she comes again. I'll let go. Nay, Sergeant Merrill, don't go. I have something of grave import to say to thee. It's coming. <laughs> In faith, I think I'm not wanted here. Nay, Master Leonard, I have not to say to thy father that his son may not hear. True, I, I am one of the family I had forgotten. <laughs> it's about this Elsie Maynard. A pretty girl, Master Leonard. Aye, fair as a peach blossom. What then? She has a liking for thee, or I would think not. With all, with all my heart, she's as zany a little maid as you'll find on a midsummer day's march. Then be warned in time, and give not thy heart to her. Oh, I know what it is to give my heart to one who will have none of it. Aye, she knows all about that. <laughs> And why should my boy either? She's a good girl, then, Carruthers. Good enough for aught I know. But she's no girl. She's a married woman. A married woman? Touch, old lady. She promised to Jack Point, the lieutenant's new jester. Touch in thy teeth, old man. As my niece Kate sat by her bedside today, the bell she slept. And as she slept, she moaned and groaned and turned this way and that way and heard. Quoth she, then, uh, and was it then? Quoth she, then, uh, is it certain he will die in our? Quoth she, then, uh, I love him not, and yet I am his wife. Quoth she, is it not so, Kate? Aye, aye, tis even so. And thou art sure of all this? Aye, sir, for I wrote it all down on my tablet. <laughs> now mark my words, because of this bare back she spake, and he is her husband, or I'll swallow my kernel. It is true, sir. True? Why, the town is raving. Why should she marry a man who has but an hour to live? Marry? There be those who would marry but for a minute, rather than die old maids. Aye, I know one of those. <laughs>
So, my mysterious bride is none other than Miss Winsome Elsie. Upon my hand, I might have fared worse with my eyes open. <laughs> but here she comes. Now to test her principles. Tis not every husband who has a chance of wooing his own wife. Mistress Elsie. Master Leonard. So, thou leavest us tonight. Yes, Master Leonard, I have been kindly tended, and I almost say I am to go. Uh, and the staff has. Was thou glad when he escaped? Why, truly, Master Leonard, it is a sad thing that a young and gallant gentleman should die in the very fullness of his life. Oh, then when thou didst faint in my arms, it was for joy at his safety. Well, it may be so, but I was highly wrought, Master Leonard, and I am but a girl, and when I'm highly wrought, I faint. <laughs> now dost thou know that I am consumed with a parlous jealousy? Thou? And of whom? Why, of this fair fact, surely. I shall I be frank with thee? Elsie, I love thee ardently, passionately. Elsie, I have loved thee these few days, which is a long time, and would fain join my life to thine. Master Leonard, thou art jesting. For well, jesting, may I shrivel into ravens if I jest. <gasps> I love thee with a fever. I love thee with a frenzy. I love thee with a love that eateth up my heart. What sayest thou? Thou wilt not let my heart be eaten up. Oh, mercy, what am I to say? Now dost thou love me, or hast thou been impertinent these few days? Oh, I love all brave men. Nay, there's love in excess. I thank heaven there are many brave men in England, but if thou lovest them all, then I withdraw my thanks. I love the bravest best, but, sir, I may not listen. I am not free. I Oh, a wife? Who is his name? His brain is on his epitaph, sir. Come his name. Oh, sir, keep my secret. It is the only barrier that fate could set up between us. My husband is none other than Colonel Fairfax. <gasps> the greatest villain on home? The most ill favored, ill mannered, ill natured, ill omened, ill shepherd dog in Christendom? It is very like. He is not to me, for I never saw him. I was blindfolded, and he was to have died within the hour. And he did not die, and I am wedded to him, and my heart is broken. <laughs> oh, he was to have died, and he did not die. The scoundrel, the perjured, traitor, villain. Thou shouldst have insisted on his dying first, tis the only way to be spare fact. I now wish I had. What thirsty little maiden. I'll take for this fair fact. Be mine. He will never know it. He dares not show himself. And if he dare, what art thou to him? Fly with me, Elsie. We will be married tomorrow, and thou shalt be the happiest wife in England. Master Leonard, I am amazed. It is gossip to bring soldiers speak to poor girls. Oh, for shame, for shame. I am wed, 
Not the less because I love not my husband. I am a wife, sir, and I have a duty. Oh, sir, thy words terrify me. They are not honest. They are wicked words and unworthy thy great and brave heart. Oh, shame upon thee, shame upon thee. Oh, Elsie, I did my best. I <laughs>
with both eyes at once, this and that. <laughs> the testimony of one eye is not, he may lie. But when it is corroborated by the other, it is good evidence that none may gainsay. Here are both present in court, ready to swear to him. But art thou charged with Fairfax? Saw you his face? Aye, and a plaguey ill favored face, too. A very hangdog face. A felon face. A face to fright the headman himself and make him strike a ride. Oh, a plaguey bad face. Take my word for it. <laughs> How they laugh. Tis ever thus with simple folk. And accepted wit has but to say, pass the mustard, and they roll their ribs up. <laughs> if ever I come to life again, thou shalt pay for this, Master Points. Now, Elsie, thou art free to choose again. So behold me. I am young and well favored. I have a pretty wit. I can just you, drive you, keep you, crazy you, you. Thou knowest not how to woo. Tis not to be done with time worn jests and threadbare sophistries, with quips, conundrums, rhymes, and paradoxes. Is an art in itself and must be studied bravely and conscientiously. <laughs> He should practice himself at fourteen and practice from morning to evening. And when he's of age, if he will or in age, he may capture the heart of a queen. The heart of a queen. It is purely a matter of skill, which all may attain if they will. But every time he must study.
Now listen to me. Now listen to me. His son Lux. Mr. Southsea, there is one here who, as thou knowest, loves thee right well. That he does, right well. He is but a man of poor estate, but he hath a loving, honest heart. And if thou wilt be his wife, thou shalt lie curled up in his heart like a little squirrel in its nest. Tis a pretty figure. A maggot in a nut lies closer. <laughs> but a squirrel will do. He knows that thou wast a wife, an unloved and unloving wife. And his poor heart was near to breaking. But now that thine unloving husband is dead, and thou art free, he would fain pray that thou wouldst hearken unto him and give him hope that thou wouldst one day be his. He presses a hand and whispers in our ear, Oh, Bob, you, what does this mean? And now, sweetheart, tell me, wilt thou be this poor good fellow's wife? He's a good, brave man. Is he a brave man? So many say. Uh, that's not true, but uh, let it pass. If the brave man will be content with a poor, penniless, unsought maid. Widow, but let that pass. Then I will be his true and loving wife. But not with my heart and hearts. My own dear love. Why, what's all this? Brother, brother, it is not saintly. Oh, I can't let that pass. Hold it not, Master Lynn. An advocate should have his fee, but methinks thou art overpaying thyself. Nay, that is for Elsie to say. I promise thee I would show thee how to woo. And herein lies the proof of the virtue of my teaching. Go thou and show it elsewhere. <laughs> And I've kept the 
music and pretend I was his being loving sister. I did everything I could to make folks believe I was his loving sister. And this is his gratitude before I pretend to be sister to anybody again. I'll turn none. I to be sister to everyone. One as much as another. <laughs> In tears. <laughs> What a plague art thou grizzling for now? Why, am I grizzling? Now has often come for jealousy. Well, tis for jealousy I weep for now. I, yellow beast, godless jealousy, shall make the most of that master Wilfred. But I have never given thee cause for jealousy. The lieutenant took me, and I are but the merest gossips. Jealous? Of me? Ah! I am jealous of no craven cock of the hill who crows about what he do and he dared. I am jealous of another and better man than thou. Set that down, Master Wilfred, and he is to marry Elsie Maynard, the little pale fool. Set that down, Master Wilfred. If my heart is well thy broken, then thou that hast it all. The <laughs> man thou lovest is to marry Elsie Maynard, uh, but, but that is no other than thy brother, Leonard Merrill. Oh, mercy, what have I said? Why, what manner of brother is this, thy lying little jade? Speak! Who is this man thou hast called brother? And and coddled, and kissed, and with my connivance, oh Lord, with my connivance too, should it be this Fairfax? Ha ha! It is! It is this accursed Fairfax! It's Fairfax! Fairfax, who? Now is the shot to the head and who lies at the bottom of the river. Mistaken. We are but fallible mortals, the best of us. But I'll make sure. I'll make sure. Say, one word. Uh, I think it cannot be Fairfax. Mind, I say I think. Because thou hast slain Fairfax. And whether he be Fairfax or no Fairfax, he is to marry Elsie. And, and as thou hast shot him through the head, and he is dead. Be content with that, and I will be thy wife. <sighs> Is that sure? Ah, huh? Sean, there's no help for it. Oh, thou art a merry brute. The team of brutes must marry. I tell you. My beloved. <laughs> Phoebe, rejoice. <laughs> or I bring glad tidings. <laughs> Colonel Fairfax's retreat is signed two days since, but it was foully and maliciously kept back by Secretary Poltwistle, whose design that it should arrive after the Colonel's death. But it hath just come to hand and is now in the Lieutenant's possession. <laughs> the Colonel's free. Oh, kiss me, kiss me, kiss me, Colonel. Oh, Tom, death of my life, art thou mad? Am I mad? Are we all mad? Come away from him, thou hussy, thou jade, thou kissing, clinging cockatrice, and as for thee, sir, devil take thee. I'll rip thee like a herring for this. I'll cleave thee to the chine. I'll skin thee. I'll... Phoebe, Phoebe, who is this man? Peaceful, he is my brother. Another brother? Are there any more of them? Produce them all at once and let me know the worst. This is a real man, an adult. <laughs> the other was but his substitute. The real man, as I say, my father's own son. How do I know this? Has he brother written large on his brow? I mistrust thy brothers. Thou art but a false jade. <laughs> now, Wilfred, be just. Truly, I did deceive thee, but it was to save a precious life. 
and to save it not for me, but for another. Come, the hours were this very day. Is not that enough for thee? Come, I am thy Phoebe, my very own, and we will wed in a Phoebe, or two. Hast thou heard the brave news? Ay, father. I am nigh mad with joy. Oh, ay, what's all this? Oh, father. He's discovered the secrets of my folly and the price of his silence is... Phoebe's heart. Oh, dear, no. Phoebe's hand. Uh, it's the same thing. Is it? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tis pity that the colonel had to be saved at any cost. And if the thy folly revealed our secret, tis thy folly must e'en suffer for it. <laughs> Dave Carruthers! <laughs> Archfiend, and I have taken it. A word from me, and three heads and five heads would roll from their shoulders. Nay, the colonel is reprieved. But if my complicity in his escape were known, oh, plague of the old meddler. Well, there, there's nothing for it but uh, hush, pretty one. Such bloodthirsty words, he'll become those cherry lips. Oh. Why, look ye, Chuck. <laughs> I've thought to myself for these many months, I've thought uh, there must be some snug love saved up in that middle-aged bosom for someone. But it might as well be thee. Uh, that's thee. Uh, so why not take heart and tell her, uh, thee, that thou, uh, me, uh, lovest her, thee, and uh, I'm just a miserable old man, and there I've done it, and that's me. But not a word about Fairfax. The price of thy silence is... Merrill's heart. Oh, no, 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 no. Merrill's heart. It's the same thing. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Rapture, rapture, when the thundery flood swept after thee, the thundery joy and jollity, the hen's holiday, rain to volley, rapture, rapture, joy and jollity, the hen's holiday, rain to volley, rapture, rapture. Joy, full, joy, full, when humanity went its all full of satanity, causing primity, down declivity, six captivity, doll, full, doll, full, causing primity, down declivity, six captivity, doll, full, doll, full, joy, full, joy, full, when virginity meets for point full man. Ghastly, ghastly, when men's horrible, firstly, lastly, up to morrow, after Terry, yields to Harry, goes a merry, ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful, ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful, ghastly, ghastly, joyful, joyful, ghastly, ghastly, ghastly.
Oh! 